Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Cody Wolf. I am an ACS CAN volunteer here in the great state of Idaho. We're here at Boise State University, and I'm going to show you the research lab that I work in. So come on in. So this is what a cancer research lab looks like. We're here in the Jorsic lab at Boise State University. Again, my name is Cody Wolf. I'm a graduate student here at Boise State in the Biomicrosciences Sciences PhD program, and we study cancer research. Specifically, we study how inflammatory proteins promote the spreading of cancer cells throughout the body. And today, we're gonna to give you a little bit of tour of our lab and talk about how uh, important NIH funding is for cancer research. So let me show you around the lab just real quick. We have a lot of really fun equipment. Uh, we have a bench area here that is specifically dedicated to look at proteins and RNA and DNA and see how those change with different treatments that we do. We have huge freezers that get really cold. This is minus 80 degrees Celsius where we keep all of our samples. They need to be stored in the deep freezer like RNA and proteins. We also have under this little cabinet a liquid nitrogen storage where we actually store human cells that we use and treat with. And so they got to stay very cold so that we can use them. Uh, and these come from patients, real patients, that donate their samples and let us use their cells so that we can study uh, human cells inside the lab. We also have a few people that are here with us in the lab. We have Maria, who's a graduate student, just like me, doing research. Um, this is where I do all my research in the lab. This is my bench top and my laptop area. We have a few things that we have on the shaker there that we're currently looking at to see how protein expression changes when we treat ourselves with a variety of different things. Um, we have other areas to do some pipetting and things along those lines that are really, really exciting and fun. We have computers here to do analysis software and analyze all the fun data that we collect within the lab. We also have um, some areas where we use chemicals that can be kind of dangerous to us. And so we have a special hood called the chemical hood, this blue guy right here. And uh, this is where we work with any chemical that might be dangerous for us to breathe or work with. Uh, we have gloves that we put on and all the air that comes in here gets out and purified so that it's safe for us to use. Now, if we go over here into the special room, we have what's called our cell culture space. We have Terrell here, another graduate student. Say hi, Terrell. Hi. Um, he is currently working with human breast cancer cell lines and he's giving them media, which is what they use to live off of. And if I put a glove on here, make sure I'm safe. Our cells live inside this incubator and they are at 37 degrees C uh, and 5% CO2, which is the environment they love to be in. They're nice and warm and toasty and it's sterile so that we don't contaminate ourselves. So I'm gonna spray my hand with some ethanol, make sure I'm nice and sterile. And our cells live inside these flasks right here and um, we use them, we plate them into different things, and we treat them with whatever we want to to see what effects we have. And so these are breast cancer patient cell lines that have been derived. Uh, the cell lines that we have go all the way back to the 70s and have been around for a really long time, and they're really important for what we do here in our lab. We also have microscopes that we use to look at our cells. This is just a regular lab microscope to see how the cells look. But we also have fluorescent microscopes because cells are actually transparent unless we decide to dye them with a stain, which is what you're seeing here. And this blue color that you're looking at is actually the DNA inside the cells. And each little dye is a different cell and the DNA inside each of that cell. And so we can see we have a big clump of cells here and a smaller clump of cells here. And so we can use that to see how the cells act and um, operate differently within a variety of situations. And so this is just a quick tour of the lab and what it looks like within a lab. As you can see, we have a lot of tubes and things that we do a lot of a variety of things with. And so it's very exciting and there's always some stuff going on and always people that are running around doing a bunch of science. So I believe that with this tour, we also have some questions that are gonna be asked and questions from the audience. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please put it into the chat and um, we'll get started with the questions. Great, thanks, Cody. So first question is Donna from Pennsylvania asks, what obstacles to your research are created when funding is inadequate? And what would happen if funding was cut? Well, Donna, that's a great question. Uh, so everything that you just saw inside the lab is funded by the National Institutes of Health, NIH, or the National Cancer Institute, NCI. And so if we don't have funding, we can't buy the equipment that we need. 
That includes the media that Terrell was working with for the cells. We need to buy that to keep the cells alive and growing. We need to buy products to test them. We need to buy all the equipment, like the plasticware that we use and everything inside the lab has to come from some sort of funding source. And for us in a cancer research lab, that's almost always NIH. And for any other biomedical lab, it's almost always NIH. And so when we don't have money, we can't buy the basic necessities that we need to continue to do research. So it's extremely important that we have a continued funding source like the NIH to keep our lab alive and running. Next question is from Michelle in New Hampshire. She asks, what is the hardest part of being a cancer researcher? Oh, wow, that's a really good question. Um, I think the hardest part about being a cancer researcher is the, um, the effect that it has on individuals is really impactful, but um, it takes a while for the research to make it to patients. And so what we do here in the lab is we study a protein that we have shown promotes the spreading of breast cancer cells from the primary site to a different site throughout the body. And we've actually developed a drug to try to inhibit this process but it's very complicated to make a drug. It takes a long time and it can be challenging when you really want to make a change in a patient's life, uh, but you aren't quite able to get there for a variety of different reasons. And so that's one of the most challenging aspects, but it's also one of the most rewarding aspects too, because we know that everything we do inside the lab makes a different difference for a cancer patient. And so we're happy to come in and do all the work. Um, it's also very time consuming uh, when we're working with cell lines, they tend to do what they want to. They tend to grow at the speed they want to. And so sometimes if I plate on a Thursday, they might not be ready Friday. So that means I got to come in on Saturday and I got to do a treatment. Um, that could be pretty detrimental to your plans if you want to go have an afternoon fun on Saturday, but you have to come into the lab and work. Um, that tends to happen a lot. And so that can definitely be challenging. Uh, and there's a big aspect with the research that we don't see is that there's a lot of writing behind the scenes where we have to write grants to fund everything that we do. And so in addition to doing all the research, we also have to write grants and write papers and make sure that we get uh, the funding and that we share our research with the rest of the community so that other people can benefit from, from what we do as well. All right, next question is from Alejandro in Virginia. I've heard some people say that the pace of discovery and finding new cures for cancer has been slow. Sometimes it's hard to see the impact of research. So how would you address this concern and why does progress sometimes seem slow? That's a really good question. Uh, so I will admit progress is definitely slower than people might be used to um, in the research world compared to other areas. And the truth is, is that it's because it's really complicated. Uh, research is something that you do in a very strict environment. You want to try to remove as many variables as possible to make sure that you're seeing the effect that you're trying to see very clearly. And then you have to share that result with the rest of the community. We call that peer review when you publish a journal. It gets peer reviewed by other experts of the field. And they decide if your research has merit. And if it does, they're going to let your journal be published and they're going to look at it and interpret it. And then they're gonna make their own changes to it and uh, expand on that research. And that can be a very long process. A lot of research is happening in a lot of different fields that's very important and useful, uh, but it takes a long time for that to be shared with the public and utilized. Uh, there are examples though where research is really fast. One of the biggest examples is with vaccine production in the last few years. Uh, we've had a huge advancement in the way vaccines are made, and now we can make a vaccine in two days versus before it took several months. Um, with cancer research, we have a huge advancements now with clinical trials that happen a lot faster because we've gotten a lot smarter on how we can treat patients and sort them into groups to make it more efficient. And so while research can take a while, we do everything that we can to make it as um, efficient and as fast as possible. And we have a few live questions from oh, the great. audience. So first is, can you give us some ideas on the costs of some of these items, like slides or glass vials, even rubber gloves and the number used daily? It's hard for me to imagine the cost of the large machines and understand what they do, but these smaller items is something I feel we can all relate to. Yeah, great question. So if we talk about large equipment, it can be very, very expensive. The incubators that I showed you earlier, um, we actually just bought one last year that was about $20,000. 
Um, a simple centrifuge that spins down cells is about $10,000. But when we talk about basic necessity, um, a bottle of media to make it makes is going to cost about thirty to forty dollars per bottle, and depending on how fast you go through it, it, can be really expensive. Sometimes we go through a bottle a week. Sometimes we go through multiple bottles a week. Um, for plasticware, it can be anywhere from fifty dollars to a few thousand dollars a month, depending on how many experiments we're running. And so, um, the average cost to run a cancer lab is about um, $10,000 a month. And that is quite a bit of money when you talk about everything that we do. Uh, but it's extremely important because everything that we do goes towards um, continuing the research and building a scientific knowledge that other people can do other things with our work. And so um, it's really expensive to run a, a cancer lab. Another live question. So what are some of the ongoing products taking place in the lab where you work? Uh, so we are a basic science lab, which means that we're trying to understand the fundamental process of how cancer spreads throughout the body. Uh, but we are in development of a drug that could inhibit the protein that we study. And uh, that's the only, I would say, product that we have going through. We do um, have some techniques that we've created that other scientists use that have been published in the past. Uh, but as far as the only product that we have, it's that one. And um, we're currently in the preclinical stages of testing. Um, we're trying to make it a better drug. We want to make sure that we can give it to patients orally instead of um, IV, which is kind of a traditional way to give a chemotherapy. And so uh, that's, that's the product that we're working on. We're several years out from getting that to clinical market. We still have a lot of testing we need to do with that. But um, yeah, definitely something that's really exciting to, to work on for sure. And one more live question. Why did you choose to become involved in cancer research? Well, that's a really good question. And it actually partners a little bit with my role as ACS CAN. Um, I started my cancer research journey by attending a Relay for Life event, an ACS Relay for Life event, where I heard the story of a patient who was a um, young cancer survivor who was diagnosed at the age of 15 with osteosarcoma. And her story is really inspiring. It really kind of brought it to home. At that time, I didn't have any relatives who had been facing cancer. And so it really struck a nerve in my heart. And so I was an undergraduate biology student at the time. And I decided maybe I should think about cancer as a future endeavor. And so I um, took a class by my mentor, Dr. Cheryl Jorsik. Um, she teaches a cancer class here at Boise State. And I learned a lot about the complexity of cancer. This is actually the textbook that we use for our class called The Biology of Cancer. You can see it's pretty thick and pretty complicated. And um, it was really interesting class and I learned so much and learned how complicated the disease was. And I felt like I could marry the two interests that I have in my advocacy and in my scientific interests. And so I joined your lab and I've been here since 2016 and um, it's been the best decision I've ever made. And now I'm getting ready to graduate with my PhD, hopefully next March and continue on with cancer research. So it's been really, really fun. And I'm really glad I, I made that choice. Excellent. Another live question. Do you work with HeLa or Hella cells? That's a great question. Uh, and so if anybody doesn't know what the HeLa cell line is, it is a cell line derived from a patient named Henrietta Lacks. Uh, and they were um, illegally and um, not very ethically sourced from this patient. They're cervical cancer cell lines. We don't work with them because our lab is a breast cancer lab. And so we look at breast cancer cell lines. They do come from patients and they do come from patients who willingly give the samples. And so uh, we work with cell lines that don't have an interesting name. They're called T47Ds, which is just a bunch of numbers and letters. Uh, MCF7 is another version of these cell lines. Uh, but they're similar to HeLa cells, um, but we only focus on breast cancer and a little bit of prostate cancer, and so we don't directly work with HeLa cells. Yeah, good question. All right, and moving on to one more live question. They keep coming in. What is the biggest barrier to receiving funding for a project? Wow, that's a fantastic question. Uh, so in the cancer world, the problem with getting funding is that there's too many good ideas. There are so many cancer labs out there because it's such a terrible disease and it's very complicated and there's so many different versions of it. You know, there's over a hundred different types of cancers and everybody is trying to evaluate all these different types of cancers. 
Um, and so we get, uh, the NIH, I should say, gets a lot of funding applications. And because of that, they have to limit um, how many they can award. And so the funding rate for um, cancer projects is about 9%. That means that the top 9% of grants that go to the NIH get funded. And the rest, which is um, uh, 81%, off the top of my head, I can't remember the number, <laughs> um, a large percentage don't get funded. And it's not because they're bad projects, it's because there's literally not enough money to fund those really good ideas. And so we have to limit it to uh, the 9% um, that uh, are the top of the top of the top. And so the biggest challenge of a cancer lab is the fact that funding is so difficult because so many people care about the disease and are working so hard to try to fight it that there's so many good ideas and we can only give out money to so many. All right. Thanks, Cody. I think we're on our last question. So Amy from Indiana asks, what is the best way to support researchers like you and ensure you have the funding needed to continue? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you're new to the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network or ACS CAN, um, you might not know that every year we push for an increase in NIH and NCI funding. And that's because that's the number one funding source for all cancer labs. And so every year we have our volunteers go to Capitol Hill and talk about how important NIH funding is. And what I would ask is that each one of you that are on the call today to talk to your lawmakers, your federal lawmakers to say, I know how important NIH funding is to cancer research and I want you to make it a priority. We know that um, there's a lot of issues with the budget right now and getting funding for the next year, but we wanna make sure that cancer research is a priority. We wanna make sure that the NIH is a priority. And so my action for everybody who's listening right now is to call your lawmakers, email your lawmakers, mail your lawmakers a postcard and say, I care about NIH funding and I want you to support it no matter what. Okay, I think if there are not any more questions, I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoyed an inside look of what it's like to be inside a cancer research lab. Thank you so much for joining the call. Please remember to contact your lawmaker. It really is important. We could not do the work that we do inside this lab if it wasn't for NIH funding. And the reason we've had continual NIH funding over the last few years is because of all the amazing support we get from ACS CAN volunteers like you. So if you're new or been around for 20 years, please remember that what you do is really important and that we appreciate it and thank you so much. I hope you have a fantastic evening and um, talk to you soon.